All right. So welcome to today's program, Advising Student Organizations, Building a Relationship with Officers and Members of Those Student Organizations. I thank you all for attending and for the role that you play or are looking to play with our many organizations on campus. And I know I've worked with some of you directly in the past and some of you I haven't worked as closely with, but I thank you for attending and look forward to working with you more in the future. My name is Mike Pastella, and I am the Assistant Director of Campus Life for Student Involvement. And my office is linked, and normally I would be um, presenting this in 133 on the concourse there. We'd be having a, a great time um, after grabbing lunch or having lunch um, all together in MCZ and saying hi to our students on the concourse. However, today we're in various locations and coming together to think about our organizations that way. So the, the start of this program and to a degree of focus of it, this one's a little more introspective and um, also gives a time to reflect on your personal engagement and involvement and what that is. So feel free to um, where you'd like to, to share with examples that way as we move forward. Um, from your personal experiences to um, your comfort level to, to share with that or, you know, think about it quietly and, and think to yourself that way about things. And if you were um, viewing the presentation um, later on, um, certainly feel free where appropriate to pause it to, to think about what we cover and, and how that plays out. So with that, the... Um, oops. The big question, why are you an advisor? So it might be for some an internal motivation. It might be for some helping with the department. It, it might be the interest in a, a student who's done research for you that you've helped out in the, that's helped you out in the past in, in giving back that way. What are some of the reasons that you said yes to the organization you advise or are looking to advise an organization? So I find that our amazing advisors come from many different paths for many different reasons. And sometimes it's because they want to help that student who's been really active in their class. Sometimes it's because it's rekindling a passion or an interest that they had when they were an undergrad or grad student. Sometimes it's about community engagement. And sometimes it's just let's try this out and see where it goes that way. That's something we'll get to think about with some of these thought questions forward. Oh, it looks like there was something in the chat, so I apologize for not checking. Ah, so one's daughter asked them to, to get involved. Yes, that's um, certainly a, a family connection or a friend connection that way. Um, I'll admit I um, was uh, one of the organizations I advise. It was because a colleague asked me to help them out and how that plays out and that will, will come out with some of our questions as well. So a wide variety of reasons why we advise. Okay. Which leads us to I'll apologize as I'm, I'm clicking a bit. Um, what are your goals and purpose in being an advisor? And there are no wrong answers. So anyone that would like to share any of your goals or purposes in being an advisor? 
one reason is to, uh, or one goal is to provide continuity to the club um, so that as the students come and go, you know, we're the, the constant supposedly, right? <laughs> Exactly. That is a great goal is the continuity because the students come in and where those students are when they come in. Some students come in and once they're added to the officer role in Laker life, they know how to update everything, re-register everything, reserve everything and just roll with it. And some of them are like, cool, I just won the election and um, now what? And they have no idea what to do. And um, as that guiding force and as that consistent person with the organization, being able to share with them, so did you re-register or have you visited the point and saw where our mailbox is, uh, which is happening less now than in a traditional semester, or did you reach out to Lisa Evaneski and sign up for Title IX training? And have you reserved the room that we always use? Again, in traditional semesters, but in this case, have you set up the Zoom and shared it with everyone so that they know where our meeting is and how that's going to play out that way? So consistency and guiding them through those things, which in some ways become old habit to us because maybe we've done it for three, four, five, ten 10 years. Uh, but is the first time for that officer working through it. Other goals or purpose anyone would like to share and why you advise your organization? For many, I know it's a sense of giving back. That's a big part of it for me. I was fortunate in undergrad to have some wonderful organization advisors. And I see this as part of that reciprocal cycle of being able to give back to organizations that might be similar or dramatically different to those that I was involved in in undergrad that way or in community activities. So a variety of things that way. Okay. So what do you have to offer these organizations that you advise? Hi, Mike. Hi, everybody. This is Jill Pippen, and I do advise a sorority on campus, and, and uh, I just wanted to jump in here um, and just say, first of all, that I agree with your statement about wanting to give back and to try to help support students in, in their, you know, because of my past, but also because uh, I just feel like this gives them a personalized touch in, in you know, being an, eight, an institution of 8,000 students, it could be easy to feel um like one of a number um and so being affiliated in a in a group like this allows them to have more um affinity with each other and with a group so i think it's healthy and i want to try to support them in in all the ways that, that i can and in terms of what do i have to offer uh based on my experience as a student but then also because i'm affiliated with the college i, I feel like there are things that i can help steer them to think about um, and in particular, you know, connecting their work within their group to their ultimate career path is, is what I, I try to, to focus on and, and assist them with. Yes, building those bridges and where that plays out. So it's amazing to see how those connections can play forward that way in regards to, um, so for, for example, if you're advising an organization that is similar to one that you used to be part of in knowing someone in that career path or knowing someone in that profession. And that's one of the things we'll look at as a reward too, how, how our students become our colleagues and, and what that's like. You know, I know that's a neat experience for me is having former students that I've worked with or advised that now work in my profession or work in other professions and assist me that way. A former student association president happens to be my insurance advisor and how that um, role turned around that way in regards to I advised him, now he advises me, <laughs> how that plays out. So these are roles that can grow and build over time. A few other things that popped up in the chat, not knowing if everyone can see that or not, but um, working with international students because it's a passion and a role of the work that one does and empowering young women, particularly in the sorority, but in any setting that way, as far as empowerment goes that way. And I think part of that too is what allows us to even work and challenge 
some myths, um, some stereotypes, some things that hold us back. I know I had a pretty powerful experience for a few years um, advising an organization that was a faith-based organization and not a faith that I personally practice. Uh, but the student leader who I'd worked with was in a pinch and some holidays were coming up and they were about to be frozen as an organization and so pleaded with me and I said, okay, but it's only for the end of the semester. Three and a half years later, I was able to hand them off to someone who was able to advise them and work with them that in, in a more personal perspective of the faith. But it was really, I think, powerful for them to include me in some activities that I attended and to learn from them in, in practices that I wouldn't traditionally participate in. And so we both grew from that as well. So I think how we offer ourselves in many ways to the organizations we advise helps in their growth, but hopefully in ours too. So how have you grown from being involved in organizations and or your community? Maybe that goes back to undergrad, maybe it's high school, maybe you're on a school board now or a town council or a local theater and arts group that you're helping promote and move forward. Cool. I think for me, one of the things, um, since I've been an advisor um, for some of the organizations, two different organizations. One has been traditionally been here, so they're more organized. So they kind of require help as needed, but it's not frequent. But knowing that working with a younger organization, trying to mold them and, you know, I've tried to, you know, kind of input some of my um, professional knowledge, impose that on them because they also lack some of those leadership skills that they're now trying to develop and try to, and they're trying to, um, you know, find an identity for the organization themselves. So like I've kind of worked on those groundwork a lot. And for me, it shows as far as being involved in those organizations, for me, I've been able to kind of, um, I would say, see things from more or less the more being, being more student focused. I'm not trying to impose my own values and my judgments, you know, about certain things that they're trying to do, because that's sometimes where the competing interest comes in, uh, especially with a young organization. So, but I think, Charlene, I think you're right on in regards to challenging and supporting, because some of them need to be challenged and supported as they move forward, especially when the topic's new to them, or the organization is new to them and things play out differently for them in regards to what they're used to that way. And that's something that I've found exciting um, in advising organizations is where they, where they transition and cycle. Um, because there are times when they're running really smoothly and it's as simple as, how can I assist you? You know what I have to offer. And um, you kind of step back, watch it go and are like, wow, what an amazing group of students and look at what they're pulling off. And then there's other times as officer cycle and things happen where it is very, you know, getting more granular. Okay, so well, why didn't you speak to this person in advance of thinking you could use the room? <laughs> and uh, maybe we should let the department chair know that we're working on this at, before we try and share it with all the students in the office or the um, office manager that way and where that plays out and knowing that balance because our, um, our role can ebb and flow with the um, skill sets and abilities of the student leaders that way too and how we adjust to what they need to the situation and their abilities that way. Great perspective. Would anyone else like to show or share about um, how they've grown from being involved with organizations and how, then how that might impact you as advisors? I know for me, it's one of those things that's almost 
omnipresent but in different ways and, and i'll joke with my leadership class at times that i'm not quite sure how i'll write the book um, but when i compare and contrast and look at some of the things from coaching first and second graders playing soccer and having been the president of an executive board of an alumni board of a college and the similarities and differences <laughs> that are found um, in working with those that range from 8 to 80 in those very various um, situations and scenarios and what we can bring to the to the table that way and where that works out and um, again how we hold back and where we give depending on where those organizations are at so when you are involved in um, maybe a community music group, or you are involved in a social justice movement, that can also impact how you advise groups and how you challenge and support them in their growth process that way. And so that's something to, something to think about is how have your past experiences led to this point and how do you utilize those um, to help those you're advising grow in their organization and their roles that way. All right. So now this is a fun one. And I will admit this is the first one that I'll actually have some bullets afterward with some answers. Um, so I wanted to have those first uh, four or five questions very open ended um, for us to think about, maybe share about if we were comfortable and see what um, what we think about in our role, what brought us to our role and how that plays out. Uh, but now to share some, what are some ways in which you've gotten to know the officers and members of the organization you advise? So um, before I share some, what, what are some others out there that um, fellow advisors would like to, to share? Hi, Mike. Um, if I can jump in here. Uh, hi, everyone. So I actually uh, have a group me account, uh, an ongoing group chat with the eboard members of the International Student Association. And that's that has proven to be a really effective way for me to remain in contact with them because students, they're going to be looking at their phones. They're not going to be doing that over email. Um, and trying to wrangle everyone into a Zoom meeting uh, when I'm working with five students who all have different schedules is really hard. So this is like kind of a quick and effective way to do that. Um, prior to COVID, we used to have little like tea sessions. What are some ways? And that, that's been nice. That's fantastic, yes. And again, knowing, knowing the population, so you know, with the community that you're advising with those, that those organizations that the group chat works really well. And that's something that you're comfortable doing. So that works well. And then the tea ceremony or tea meetings and how that plays out. I know a few years ago when ASA was going through some transitions and the success that they had and moving from trying to have a dinner that they really weren't prepared for to having a tea ceremony and the impact of that on their members to get that win and have that success. So that's a really important thing to know where you can meet them. And, and a lot of that goes to comfort levels too, because for some people that may not be in the same spot. As I say, we have uh, went to some horse shows, watched them perform, uh, become friends with some of them that way. Yeah, our um, relationships definitely change as um, we get to know our students and engage with them and see their passions and where those activities are that way. Yes, another great share. Um, initial meetings, share about yourself. Have them share. Icebreakers and team building is a big part of things, um, which goes right into uh, where we're going with some of those tangibles in regards to getting to know the board. So. You know, meeting that executive board um, when you, your time allows and, and if you can, having those key one-to-one -one meetings with officers 
uh, to see if they know about their role. And sometimes that can be as direct as sitting down with the Constitution. Sometimes that's not required. And it's more of, okay, do you have a sense of now that you're going to be president where that's going to go? And some of them really know that as they come into things. And again, others need some of that guidance to, to review and go over and see where it will play out that way. When you can, going to a full organization meeting. And some groups look for that regularly. Other groups may not be looking for that happening all the time and knowing that balance of when you think they need you and when they're okay being on their own and having that conversation up front. That's definitely something with some of the organizations looking for advisors now that I'll share with them is think about what are you looking for from this person and what's gonna go into that relationship and then what do you be open because that advisor is going to have some things they want to know from you in your side of the relationship that way. Where you're comfortable doing it, icebreakers, team building, sharing activities, um, and some of the things that you might use in class. If the first couple of weeks of class, you use some of those to have students starting discussions and moving forward and working with the group that way, because that bond is, is pretty big and it, you'll be surprised some of the things that students will come to you with and ask for support with that go way beyond the organization. And if you've built this uh, relationship with them, that's something that really helps out. Letting them know who you are. That's, um, I know um, as I opened up, I joked with some that were here that I had moved to the dining room table um, today, which is currently normally the, uh, well, has become the ninth grade classroom um, in our household versus the with a little table in the hallway that I'm normally working from at home. Um, but with that, as far as um, what you share of yourself, because I had met with some student leaders at one point and um, had a virtual background up in, in a follow-up meeting. And in the first meeting, I didn't have the virtual um, backup. And I could see that there was a reaction from some of them to looking at the space. And I was like, what's up? And they're like, oh, well, okay, that's a cool picture of the MCC behind you. And I was like, oh, does it look weird? Because I know sometimes a virtual background looks weird. And they're like, well, no, but last time we were checking out, you're in the back area where you had some of your Rams helmets and some books on the shelf and your dog ran by. And I was like, oh, okay, <laughs> like I thought I was being kinder now that I have something where I can do virtual. And they wanted that real thing. They wanted that tangible thing. They liked the fact that my dog barked because there happened to be someone knocking on the door, dropping off a package while we were meeting. Um, and that made it more tangible. That made me more real to them um, versus seeing the beautiful picture of um, the MCC, which had been behind me at that point. And then how we're approachable and where that plays into things too, in regards to our activities. You know, attending programs and service projects when it's practical. And that's something for our organizations. You know, if you're commuting in and they're doing a program in the traditional semester at eight or nine o'clock at night on campus, maybe you can't attend all those, uh, but maybe you can. Maybe it's easier now to engage with the organization in new ways because it is a Zoom program at night and, it, and it's easier for you to jump into that and see them and connect with them on that level that way, which could be very meaningful for them. You know, assisting in that transition, which goes back to those one-on-one -on -one meetings. Uh, one of the things with one of the groups I advise I like to do is meet with some of the key advice officers one-to-one. -one. It might even be brief. It might be like a 10, 15 minute meeting and then try and participate or set up for them to have an outgoing, ingoing meeting where they can have some of those formal discussions, but also have some fun about the role and do some of those icebreakers. Um, one thing I know that empowerment and um, working through myths and things uh, was mentioned earlier. At one point while advising a um, sorority, that and I was going to present at one of their meetings, I actually uh, baked cookies and, and brought those to the meeting. And it was one of those things they're like, whoa. And um, a couple years earlier, part of what was cool with that was I had been talking to an officer of the Women's Center 
And they're like, well, would you bake something? Because we're trying to get men to bake certain things and do things to break up stereotypes. And I like, I'd love to, whenever you do that, that type of bake sale thing, let me, let me know and I'll help out. And I'm happy to say that everyone survived the cookies, uh, that it worked out okay when I did that. Um, so again, it's a comfort level with things in regards to how that plays out uh, for you and the organizations. But that might be something that works out when appropriate and when we can do it again, you know, going to the main level dining and MCC, going to Lakeside to share a meal. Maybe the group does an on-campus barbecue traditionally. And these are things where an advisor can engage and be involved and really becomes accessible and helps with those uh, relationships with the organizations. You know, challenging them to stay on mission. One of the key things that you do as an advisor is know the mission of the organization. And if I'm advising the geology club and the club is always talking about volleyball tournaments, well, that's maybe not where we should be. Now, it might be okay for geology club to enter a volleyball tournament, but it shouldn't, we shouldn't be losing our focus because people aren't joining the geology club to be active in volleyball that way and knowing where things are. So to help keep them that way because sometimes organizations will drift and as they lose sight of who and what they are with their mission that can also sometimes hurt their membership and their goals and where they're moving you know being listed on their laker life page it's um surprising i've had some officers where it takes a bit for the advisor to be on the page and how much it means to them to know that their advisor is listed there and that that's a big deal to some of our student leaders to have their officer name next to their advisor that way. So by doing that, you might not think it's anything. Okay, I click the accept invite, but to some of them, that's a big deal to, to be there with you. And don't be afraid to share some of this stuff in some of those icebreakers, maybe in some of the Zoom meetings that you have after this. Which leads us to rewards. And not the lotto type, <laughs> because if, if we had that, we would be able to do even more new exciting things for our organizations, um, but more the intrinsic kind of rewards that come from advising our organizations. And would anyone like to share any of the rewards that you believe you've received in your advising relationships? And again, it's okay to reflect and be introspective at this time. And then I'll be posting some that um, kind of give some of the, the sharing answers that way. I, I kind of feel like some of the rewards for me is simply in, in first of all, having much more um, direct contact with students. I don't often do that. Uh, and so, um, especially traditional age students, because I'm, I'm used to working with online, non-traditional commuter students at Syracuse campus and so on, when I do do interact with them. So it's it's great. That's a, that's a wonderful reward for me. Second of all, I, the reward of seeing these, these ladies develop um, is, it's just, I don't know, it, it's just very personal and, and uh, individual to them. And it's gratifying to me to see that I have any kind of impact and that they listen to anything that I have to say, <laughs> which I'm not sure that they completely do, but at least, uh, you know, I try. And um, um, we've been trying to do some leadership sessions, not, not just leadership, but about um, career, like I said before, career oriented discussions about um, interview skills and, and making sure they know about the resources and the compass for all that, that, that surprisingly enough, they didn't know. And um, it's just rewarding to know that I have at least some small impact in, in their lives. Those are all amazing points. And yes, especially with organizations where when you do get to go to some of the general member meetings or in the case of a sorority or fraternity, where you meet them possibly as second semester students joining the organization and seeing that growth and seeing where that takes them because some of those paths are just truly amazing to see. Um, I know, for example, there's a 
former student when they were involved with student association at first and starting to spend a lot of time at the point and met that student as a first year student who was considering becoming a senator and then they became involved with the essay courts and then watching that person as they went on to law school and how they took those experiences and how they grew and seeing them fumble sometimes as a younger student leader and how that made them stronger and where they move forward from that. And those are really key things, how we can be there to support them um, in their success and in their failures, because failure is an amazing teacher as well. And that goes to the mentoring and sharing passions and our expertise as well, because when when appropriate and when within a comfort level to share st with students how maybe you had a program, maybe as a professional, maybe as a student, maybe as a community member that didn't work out and um, what it was like to overcome that, that can be a very powerful experience um, for those students to hear that and see that, that wow, here my advisor has had these challenges too and they're a successful professional and they were able to move forward. So. I'll get through this and how that plays out and where that goes into their development as leaders that way. And again, helping our community, helping us we go, um, serving the college that way. Um, for some of us, it's very personal because we advise groups where it is our passion. For others, it might be just because you worked with those students and then the relationship grew and it's not necessarily an area of passion for you, but you enjoy helping the students and their growth that way in what you can share. And a few more rewards that I thought we could look at, and again, others can certainly share. The helping them network. If you're, um, you know, there there have been a few students through the years that I know have met with me, and they'll, they'll come in and they'll be like, well, I wanna to talk to you about your job. And I'm like, okay. And they're like, well, you know, I'm such and such major, but after having worked with you, after having a good relationship with my hall director, all of a sudden they think I want to go into student affairs and then sharing with them about grad programs, about the nature of the career and what that is and, and being for students there that way and how that moves forward. And that might come from those that you do research with or studies or a TA or someone who's in that role of the organization that isn't tied to studies, but you know people in that area of interest so that you can connect them to someone in broadcasting or connect them to someone in development or international studies and how that plays out that way. You know, getting their perspective on things is so rich and um, students love when they have an opportunity to help you learn. As we went remote in the spring, I will share that I knew next to nothing about Instagram. Uh, I was in that universe, um, but that was about it. And um, I have had some students share with me that the, um, the points page, say I still refer to it as a page, uh, but the point account in um, Instagram is one of their favorite, um, either business or college ones um, to follow now. And I was like, well, that's really cool because I barely knew how to post in March <laughs> and it's where things have gone that way. Um, so that's been in students helped me out. And I was like, okay, show me how to do this. How do I repost something? What's a story? Where does that go? How does that play out? And, um, and now getting requests from them to share information, which I wouldn't even know how to respond to six months ago. Um, so learning from students, getting their perspective and what's impactful to them and where that plays out because their lens is different than our lens. And that, that doesn't matter if you were an undergrad five years ago or 50 years ago, their lens is different than ours and how we take time to see that, try and be empathetic and see the world from their view really helps us get to know them and helps build that bond and that connection beyond the classroom. And that's a huge part of the fun with this is working with students beyond the classroom because the reality is their time in the classroom is maybe 15 to 20 hours a week um, or in the Zoom classroom at this point. And of course, there's lots of homework time and study time and preparation time, but what they're doing with that other time and how they're engaging with us is really big that way. And it makes a difference in their lives and where those relationships go and how that plays out. 
and how they impact us too. I know, as I shared earlier, our um, insurance advisor is a former student that I advise in the student organization. Um, it's always interesting to see back from students when they um, have a paper or where they're working on things. I know a science student who works in the power industry who reached back to me last year and was like, how do you think COVID's going to affect campus? And this is affecting my work here and what we have to do that way to make sure that there's healthy staff to run the power plant and how they were managing things. Um, so very powerful experiences that way. Other rewards anyone would like to share that you've experienced in your time as an advisor? And sometimes it's just being there to help them make a decision or being that sounding board. It can be a great reward to see the decisions they make. Might be counting ballots for an election. It might be them coming to you for advice as they go to graduate and are looking for things in regards to this interview or that interview. It could be just simply being there for them because they got bad news from home and needed to talk but because you engaged with them, because you did an icebreaker, because you've supported their organization, you're that person that they can come to. And that's huge, the way that we have that human impact on each other and that intrinsic reward is far greater than any sum of money. So that's what I had in regards to slides. I certainly wanted to offer an opportunity um, for others that would like to share about some of the things they've been doing. Yeah, and shared in the chat too, that, you know, work the rationale of working with students and becoming a professor in the first place, because we love our population. We love what we do. Totally agree, Bastian. Any questions for me? And I'm also, um, for those of you that are viewing this online later, I'm going to stop the recording now and then let our live attendees ask questions as well um, that they might want to ask once I stop the recording. So I'm going to, to do that now.